You're live. Yes, I am. How, How are, are you? you? Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you? Okay. Mm. So the theme today was Black Christmas, which when you said it to me, I thought you meant like, <laughs> like dark Christmas movies. And then it was like, oh no, like Christmas movies with predominantly Black casts. So the options were Miss Scrooge, A Dream for Christmas, Christmas Everlasting, Soul Santa, and The Kid Who Loved Christmas. Uh, Ms. Scrooge won. Which one would you have voted for? I voted for The Kid Who Loved Christmas because I wonder if people looked at the cast of that film. <laughs> it's stacked. It, it's it's. I, I, I feel like I still need to go back and watch that because I can't believe the number of people they put in that, including Cicely Tyson, who's in today's film. I probably would have voted for The Kid Who Loved Christmas or A Dream for Christmas. Uh, but the 70s film, uh, A Dream for Christmas, yeah. For sure. There was one film I really wanted to watch that I couldn't put on the poll because I couldn't find it online. Oh, yeah. Was A Christmas in Compton. With Keith David. <laughs> That's the one I really wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, Miss Scrooge won. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 1997 made for television film, which is a, one of countless rehashes of Charles Dickens' uh, iconic uh, novella. This, I mean, this film is so generic that the premise on IMDb is a retelling of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, yeah. <laughs> which if people don't know, is basically like this old mean rich person gets visited by three ghosts, past, present, and future, uh, to show them what their life has been and what it will be if they don't act right. So when this person wakes up on Christmas Day, they decide to act right and be generous and kind, the end. So in this movie, the Scrooge is Cicely Tyson. Ebonita. Ebonita Scrooge. <laughs> and we need to talk about the kind of business she owned, but it's basically like a bank. And she, a we'll, bank, we'll, we'll, a, we'll talk about a it. A bank pawn shop. But she <laughs> she started working at that bank years prior. And her mentor, the person who ran the bank, was is played by... Catherine Hellman from Who's the Boss? Marley. Maud Marley in this version. So Marley was an old, mean, grouchy, stingy-ass lady. And when she died, she was basically cursed into spending her eternity trying to show people the air of their ways so christmas eve night when ebonita goes to bed marley appears as a ghost and tells her you need to get your shit together three ghosts are going to visit you you need to listen and she gives her a time period she says midnight one o'clock two o'clock oh okay <laughs> which is kind of late for a lady of that age like i feel like it should have been like 9 10 11 but... could, could we start at six but when Ebonita wakes up Christmas morning, she decides to like do right by the community and gives away money and gives her main employee a big promotion and, and a turkey and some health care, some some health care benefits. The end gives back a lamp. I'm yeah, she returns a lamp to someone. <laughs> this movie was available on YouTube. So mm -hmm. I hope people got a chance to watch it if they didn't see it back when. What did you think about this movie? I did not like this uh, film version. I think Cicely Tyson, of course, is a legend, but uh, the choices that she has made, we spent, this movie is an hour and 23 minutes. We probably spent an hour talking about, oh, I wonder if it's like at the end of Betty Davis's career where she had dental issues, which kind of forced her out a wicked stepmother because the way that Tyson is, her speaking voice, it's like a robot. Well, let's start there. I, I didn't care for the movie either. Uh, Cicely Tyson, I wrote down, she sounds like a ventriloquist dummy. Like the person who's trying to voice the ventriloquist dummy. She talks like she can't open her mouth. It's like she doesn't want us to see her teeth. So I was 100% convinced maybe she had like dental issues during filming. So she didn't want us to see missing teeth. But then we learn at the end when she becomes nice that we see her big, beautiful smile. So she made a choice to sound... I'm assuming she wanted to sound like a tightwad. So the stick fell out her ass and she could speak. So she talked with her mouth closed, just like this. I, it was horrible. It was, <laughs> it was so yeah. distracting. I did not like it. I did. 
<laughs> with Sam I am. I, I would not watch this on a plane. Oh my, oh my gosh. But the opening of the film is we see this little kid. It's winter, you know, it's Christmas time. It's snowy wherever they are. And this little kid finds a quarter on like the sidewalk. And as the kid goes to pick it up, we see a shoe step on the quarter. And then we hear Ebonita tell him, you'll never make it that way, kid, in her awful voice. So just like a mean old lady. And then just, I mean, it's unrelenting for the first like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is supposed, I feel like that role, we already talked about this together, but <laughs> like I've seen like theater productions of A Christmas Carol, oh, yeah. other interpretations. And there, there's just no humor to this. I mean, there's no heart to it. I've, uh... To me, the best version is Scrooged with Bill Murray. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, but also Michael Caine in the uh, Muppets Christmas Carol, which has been years and years and years since I've seen that. But uh, the way Cicely's doing it, it was just not, it, it wasn't even fun to see her be a Grinch. No. It, no. It, it's, uh, it's like, well, why don't they burn down your house? <laughs> <laughs> like you're terrible. Or it seems like they're in a larger city. Like, why don't these people just, I mean, I don't know. She owns property and whatever. But um, speaking of her business, we see people. So like you already mentioned, I don't know if it's a pawn shop. I was a, so confused. Because we see someone walk in with a lamp and they say, like, I need $100 to bail my son out of jail. Can you give me money for this lamp? And Ebonita gives her forty dollars. She's like, "This is worth a hundred dollars." Then the next person comes in, and they're like, "You're going to evict us because our we haven't paid our rent. Can't we just pay you by rent like, by day. like daily?" And they're like, "She's like a hundred dollars a day." Yeah, she's a hundred dollars a day, and they're like, "That's almost a thousand dollars," which I would kill to only have a thousand dollars of house payment. But yes, but I know it's a different time. Anyway. So then, like, is this a property management company? Then someone's asking for a loan. Oh, they're in Rhode Island, by the way. That's a plot point. Oh, that you're mm -hmm. you're right. Then someone calls her a loan shark. And then in one description, it this business is described as a firm. I don't think anyone actually calls it a bank. No. And or if they do, it's not clear that she owns a bank. It, I don't think it's FDIC insured. Like it's <laughs> I don't know what she's doing, but she has stacks of money. That she carries home to her house. And then in like a little bitty metal uh, box that she locks, which we all know you can just rip that box open. And then they keep talking. They talk about her safe, like her hidden safe three times. And we don't see it. Like there is no real bank vault. But yeah, she brings her money home. It's She's a cat named Mortimer. I was surprised the lady like her had a cat. That she would actually keep in her house and feed it. Well, because it, um, we are introduced to the cat and it breaks something, and it, you'd think that she would have killed it. You know, Cicely Tyson is legendary and has had so many good <laughs> roles. This is not one of them. Well, what's interesting is this is directed by John Corti, who uh, previously directed her in the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, which is a big, notable title for her in the late seventies. Also, he is an Oscar winner. Uh, oh. this director, he won an Oscar for Best Documentary in 1977, the title of which was Who Are the DeBolts and Where Did They Get 19 Kids? Oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> but I said all that to say, like, you know, much respect to Cicely Tyson, but her wig in this movie is, there isn't even a part. Like, it just, you know what I kept thinking? Her hair looks as if someone took, like, a head wrap, mm -hmm. like, like a silk wrap, but it had the pattern of hair on it. And then she just wrapped that around her head. And then when we see her getting like at bedtime, when her hair is down, the light, the, the, the cinematography is bad. Mm -hmm. Because I think it makes sense that while she's like a mean Scrooge, then the film looks more dark. But then when she decides to act right, then it like, maybe the colors and the lighting would change, but it's all the same. It's just kind of drab. And then Cicely Tyson has a darker skin tone, so she needs to be lit differently. Mm -hmm. And the way she's lit is in some scenes is horrible. In fact, in one point, I thought she reminded me of the poster for the eyes of Laura Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When she's, when the ghost from Christmas past is, it, you, you just see her eyes. Yeah. Eyes. Like, I didn't like that for her. It's a Hungarian cinematographer, Elmer, Elmer, 
Regalgi, but this was written by John, the teleplay was by John McGreevy, who uh, wrote many episodes of The Waltons. Her employees, she has three of them. She's so rude, but the main one is Cratchit, this man. Mm -hmm. And Cratchit is the father of Tiny Tim. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so mean to her employees, won't let them take like the day off for Christmas. And then she finally does, but she says, well, the following week you need to work extra hours to make up for the day you miss. And then someone, well, so I'm assuming Ebonita put it up. There's a sign in the bank that says, do not wait until you're thirsty to dig a well. There's a lot of interesting signs in the bank. Um, so this was it's set in Rhode Island. It was shot in Toronto. So that's why oh. we have a lot of Canadians in the supporting cast, including the man who plays Cratchit, Jean Bourgeois. But more, more interesting than him is the man who... The woman who plays his wife, Arsene Kanjian, who is the wife of Adam Agoyan. And I thought it was so weird to see her. And I thought she looked <laughs> like, you said Timothée Chalamet. I yeah. think she looks like if you mix Timothée Chalamet with Isabella Rossellini. She has a speech pattern like Isabella, yeah. She's beautiful. Yeah, she's very striking, but uh, she's got nothing to do. No, it, well, except be mad. Like, why don't you, like, Ebonita's so mean, you work this bullshit-ass job, how are you going to take care of us? But anyway, so the three ghosts visit. So the ghost from Christmas past shows up, and what do we learn about Ebonita? When she was young, she had a loving family. It appears that maybe it was, like, the she, the, the, the 40s or the 50s? Yeah, and it, it, she was close to her father, but it appears she's resentful to how he spent money because he... He was trying to be a black business owner, and of course, they're in the South, and uh, the, the grocery store that he's purchased burns down and him in it. And it seems like it's a racially motivated thing, and Ebonita witnesses her dad be burned alive in his business. So, of course, she has really strong feelings about being successful, saving money. She also had a puppy that she lost. Mm -hmm. So that is like the beginning of her having like a cold heart. Um, the little actor who played young Ebonita, mm -hmm. Raven Kelly, she also played a, the young version of Anna Mae Bullock in What's Love Got to Do With It. Mm -hmm. She's a cute little girl. Yeah. But yeah, her family had financial problems after the dad died. I think they, end up, they ended up having to sell the home they were left by their grandmother. So she's resentful about that. She's resentful. Then, then more heartbreak. She had a, bro a brother who went to Vietnam. And then she moves to Rhode Island. Meets a guy who she seems to fall in love with, but then the guy says, which I thought was really unreasonable of her character, the guy says, I got an opportunity over here. I was hoping you'd come with me so we could build a life together. Back to the South. And she is like, hell no. And I don't think she's wrong for not wanting to go, but the way she acts about it is so unreasonable. Well, the, the, she can't communicate and be like, well, actually, my professional uh, trajectory that I'm on here. I, I don't want to lose the momentum. And then she finds out her brother died in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So she's had a lot of heartbreak, which plant, planted the seeds for why she's an awful lady today. So then the ghost of Christmas present shows up, who I thought was the gay ghost. <laughs> And this is where we get to learn about Tiny Tim. And something that's different about this movie is they actually identify that Tiny Tim has a slow-growing congenital tumor. Because mm -hmm. in most adaptations of the story, it's just that Tiny Tim is, you know, I mean, I think... He's ailing. He, yeah, he's <laughs> illiform, cripple, whatever you want to call him. But yeah, he has this unidentified condition, which I felt like is pointless in this movie to say because the little kid playing tiny tim looks quite happy and healthy yeah and he just has crutches so it's like and, and then the home his family lives in looks like a, like an industrial loft it's hobo chic yeah yeah i mean i know bo bo chic. Bo -ho -chic. <laughs> um zoe dosh or zoe bo -ho -bo -bo -chic. uh in the, the, he's late to work one day and she's 17 minutes late and the ghost from christmas present shows her uh, why he was late because he was playing with the kid and she's mean like well he it's not my fault he had all these kids and can't he get on welfare and he's like no. she's like walmart like most of their employees are on public assistance <laughs> yeah what's that family's name the walt the walton the walton yeah. uh yeah she's like well uh or the ghost tells her that he, they can't get on uh, public assistance because he makes just he a makes too much. just a little too much to be below the poverty mm -hmm. line damn um 
We also, we see Tiny Tim's sister, who I thought looked exactly like Dustin from Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. That kid, uh, yeah. Gaiden Matarazzo, who I was reading about him. He has a sister <clears throat> named Heather Matarazzo, but it's not the one we know. Not from Welcome to the Dollhouse, Heather Matarazzo. She's the one who made that video about how she's poor. From the, yes, and, after and, she got cast in the screen. And drives five. a Toyota Prius and can only buy one pair of shoes a year. Mm-hmm. Um, then the family that pawned the lamp, no, the family that was going to be evicted, mm-hmm. we find out that they did get evicted and they move into the school gymnasium. Cause the, the, wh- whoever <laughs> lets the, the ladies like, oh, the, it's not going to be used for the holiday season. So you can stay here. The, and the mom's like, the kids love it here. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're in, the gymnasium is outfitted like an apartment. It has a couch, bed. The kids are riding their bikes like around. That was unbelievable. And then the woman who lets them stay there and the mom look like they're about to have like a sexual in, like encounter. Oh, they are up in each other's faces. And yeah. the one I thought looked like the per, that that trans lady from the Crying Game. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Rodriguez. Yeah, but the way she's looking at the other ladies, like she wants to eat her alive. Uh-huh. Then, so Michael Beach is in the movie. He is Cicely Tyson's nephew, and he's a preacher man. And he gives a sermon that I thought was one of the most dry sermons I have ever heard. <laughs> Whoever wrote that. And then the story he tells is about how, like, when you're in hell, they have everyone at a big table with all this food, like, the best feast you've ever seen. But the one rule is everyone has to eat with their fork and the fork is three feet long. So obviously you can't eat with a three foot long fork, right? This sounds very Guillermo del Toro, Pan's Labyrinth. To me. But then he says in heaven, it's the same. This is the worst sto- like ale- like anecdote, whatever you want to call it. He's like in heaven, they have the same situation. Everyone's at this big table with this beautiful feast and they also can only eat with a fork. But in heaven... People feed each other. So he's like, that's what hell is when you don't want to feed each other. I think hell is more than that. Like, yeah. that, well, I don't believe in it anyway. But, uh, no, but it's like that story was garbage. And he did not seem that passionate about his sermon. No, but Michael Beach looks good. This is the same year he did Soul Food. He always looks good. Yeah. Okay. Then the Ghost of Christmas Future comes to show Eb, Eb, like Ebonita what, uh, what's going to happen. So we find out that. She ends up firing Cratchit because he asked for time off to care for Tiny Tim. Mm -hmm. And then we see Tiny Tim is dying in the hospital because he never got whatever treatment would cure a slow-growing congenital tumor. Mm -hmm. Then we see Ebonita dies, and because she didn't leave a will, because she she didn't mess with anybody, the IRS seized all of her assets. And nobody showed up to her funeral, and the two that did did not cry. Literally, no one intended. She's her like, no tears. I thought the Ghost of Christmas Future looked like if you mixed Keanu Reeves with that preacher man from Poltergeist Two. Oh my! That... <laughs> what, what's his name? Kane. Mm-hmm. If you mix Kane with Keanu Reeves, that was that Ghost of Christmas Future didn't say anything. They just stood in the corner. <laughs> that man is a notable character actor, Julian Richings. You've oh. seen you've seen him and stuff. And all kinds of stuff. So, of course, when she wakes up Christmas morning, she has a spring in her step. She finds this little boy and yells at him through her window, like, come here, little boy, and gives him money and says, go buy a turkey. She makes a paper airplane out of a 50 and throws She throws a $50 bill at him and then says, come inside. No, she tells him to go to the store and buy the biggest turkey you can find. And then he goes to the store Brings back a turkey that was cooked. Uh-huh. I thought for sure. I thought for sure he was going to bring back an uncooked turkey, and she was going to make a feast. But he brings back a cooked turkey, and she goes, "Here, take this money and go deliver this to the Cratchits." But don't tell him it's from me. But don't tell him it's from me, and then take this money for the cab fare, and then whatever money's left from the cab fare, you can keep this. And then here's some extra. That was so overly complicated. Like she should have just said, "Take this hundred dollar bill." And go deliver a turkey to the Cratchits. Especially because then she shows up at the Cratchits with a bunch of gifts. And then she has like this pot with money in it. I thought that scene was so clunky. Oh my God. But she seems insane when she's screaming. She's like Cloris Leachman in Prancer screaming at this child who's just like, who goes, I've never seen you happy before. There is no child that 
realizes that the adults he sees <laughs> are never happy. And he's <laughs> like, you're going to, you're not going to change your, or he goes, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and want your money back. Or Well, he goes, you trust me with this 50? And so she's like, I trust you with my life or something like real hyperbolic, but she's just looking to be a victim at this. So point, then but... she goes to like the homeless, like, like the soup kitchen. And that she... part. <laughs> She's like, well, the, okay, the thing I hated about this character is that when she wakes up, she's like, I want to be a different person. Like, she's so bright and happy. But then to the three people she visits, well, the two, she acts like her normal mean self. And But then she switches up. So what I mean is when she goes to the soup kitchen, she walks up all like with her brow furrowed and she's like, we have to do something about the homeless. And the guy's like, yeah, we're trying. Like, you know, it's just hard. Like these people, she's like, they need shelter and warmth and food. And then she pulls like what looks like thousands of dollars out of her purse. And she goes, well, use this, get them what they need. And here are the keys to my office. This can be a shelter. Why are you coming at people, making them at first think you're going to be mad to then surprise them? That to me feels like when people videotape them doing kind things, uh -huh. like, you, like you want a reaction. See, I wanted to see the interpretation of Ebonita Scrooge as somebody who's bipolar and she's in full <laughs> manic swing at the end. And then when she finally settles down, she realizes, like, I gave all my money away. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> then when she goes to Cratchit, she does the same thing. She walks in their house and she's like, huh. well, she we need to talk about your job. She almost just goes like, boo. She, she no, she does say boo. Yeah. Then the wife goes, oh, are you here? Like, you're not really trying to fire him on Christmas. And she goes, no. Things around here are going to change. You're getting a promotion and I'm doubling your pay and your title. And you can find a healthcare plan for your, our employees because we're going to open up a new branch. Why, why scare these people to then tell them everything's great? And then one of those ratchet ass, little, those ratchet cratchit kids goes, are you the one who makes my dad work so much? Are you the lady who makes my, that was the kid from Stranger Things. <laughs> but then Tiny Tim... <laughs> Probably the funniest moment to me is tiny because the mom is like, um, like I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And Tiny Tim gets up and looks at his mom like, "You dumb bitch! Can't you see she's the one who sent us the turkey?" <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part. And then the film just ends with Ebonita going to the church. No, we need to talk. Go back to the soup kitchen part because there's a lady. Oh yes. Well, here let let me just finish. The okay. end of the movie is Ebonita goes to Michael Beach's church and he sees her and he's surprised. Because clearly she never goes to church. The end. Okay, the soup kitchen. I wrote this down. There's a lady that has she rotten teeth. They they look like they're covered. She looks like she has wooden teeth that have. What do you? What's the stuff that grows on the side of a ship? Like plank? Uh, no, not plank. not plank. Barnacle. Barnacles. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. It looks like this lady has wooden teeth with barnacles on them, and she's shaking like Alfre Woodard in every movie where she's a crackhead, and she walks up to the soup line. And Ebonita goes... Ebonita holds out a wooden spoon to her. The big spoon that goes in the pot that you're serving people with. With some noodles and shit. This on. lady takes this spoon and lets this lady... <laughs> <laughs> I was done. I was done. And then she put that shit back in the pot. Clearly, she doesn't have her food handler's card. Like, you cannot <laughs> do that. That was so gross. <laughs> And the lady's like, thank you. <laughs> That's all I have to say. This this was not a uh, a worthy uh, adaptation of the source material. Charles Dickens would be mad. Charles Dickens, what the <laughs> hell did you do to my story? Jesus. What would you give? I'm being very nice and giving it a two. Very nice. Yeah, I'm giving it two out of five to be nice. Period. But... but <laughs> I don't know. Cicely's clearly doing a choice. We're working with a director that's worked with her before and probably didn't want to tell her that she couldn't do it. I, but it's bad. Yeah, I guess if you get Cicely Tyson, like, what are you going to do in, in in your bullshit TV movie? Like, right. you're just going to let her... It's almost like how Marlon Brando showed up to... Uh, the Missouri breaks in the dress. Yeah. Like I'm going to wear a dress. Today. Or our Island of Dr. Moreau. when oh, he's yeah. like, I'm going to be covered in white. And this is how it's going to be. Cicely Tyson's like, I'm going to talk like I had my mouth wired shut. 
And I, I, I imagine she's like, you think I've never done a version of a Christmas Carol before? I'm sure she was quite uh, difficult. Well, in the sense that like, she probably thought like, well, as a, her, you know, we were trying to, I was looking through her filmography because you're like, has she ever played something funny? And even in comedy, she's, I think a really interesting role for her is in Hoodlum, the Bill Duke film from 1990. I think that's the same year as this, uh, where she plays a brothel madam gangster woman. Uh, but she, That's a fun role because she looks really cool. But I think that she... She just, she often was, she was a very conservative person. So that's why, like. She his, seems uptight. Yeah. I'll go through the comments. Uh, so someone liked Cicely's performance. <laughs> 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 I was so distracted. I was so distracted. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I was, I was really hoping that uh, Catherine Helmand was going to be Scrooge. You have a story about her. Yeah, I have done Catherine Hellman's. I, I I did Catherine's Catherine's hair a few times. Um, she died in 2019, and this was back in 20, like 11, 20, oh, no, 2013. 2013. Yeah, but she was a very nice. She was old as hell, but she was a very nice lady. But of course, I know her as being Mona from Who's the Boss. Well, there's a very famous scene of her in Terry Gilliam's Brazil, or that as yeah. well. I really need to rewatch that. It's been a long time. But yeah, so so you know, it was fun to see her in this. But she's she's in it as the ghost telling Ebenita what's happening. But she's also in it in the flashbacks. Yeah, when as Maud. Yeah, who's always counting money, just like do you know your hands smell? Uh, I didn't want to. So I I like a diva's Christmas Carol. I didn't want to put that because I figured that would win. I wanted to pick more things that were more or things that were more obscure. I think we were looking for kooky oddities. Yeah, because there's a there's a lot out there. Or well, a diva, but even like uh, the RuPaul uh, holiday movie that was on VH1. Oh yeah, uh, I forget that. Detail. It has a similar name, like a divas or or drag. Isn't there something Christmas like ho 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 bitch or something? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Something like that. Oh, someone missed the poll. There will be others. We kind of match today, yeah. Uh, thank you, BMCK. A Christmas Carol is my favorite uh, story. It's about redemption. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the story in itself is classic, mm -hmm. but it really needs more heart and humor. And this one just... It's, I was laughing at the movie at times. It's all the the text also really sets you up for something that's poignant, and there you don't have that feeling in this version at all. No, because Cratchit and like he is surviving. And Tiny Tim doesn't look like it just doesn't seem as dire as no, because even in Scrooge with Bill Murray, which is a, a flat out comedy, there are when you go back in the past and realize what he's become such a dick, uh, it and it makes sense you can understand him and then he starts yes. to melt. It's like that, you know, that's where the, the emotion is. But there are many ways I think this could be approached, but this movie was not it. Uh, her voice was so shrill, yeah. But it, maybe that's because it's a television film, so a lot of, even her dad dying, getting burned up for racial uh, tension in the South is very kind of hinted at. And I think if this had been a, you know, imagine what somebody notable could have made this a, a theatrical release out of, and it could have been really heavy hitting. Sure. Where can an old lady send Christmas cookies to us, uh, to our PO box. <laughs> don't if you poison them, make sure they kill me. I don't. I don't want to be sick. Just like <laughs> for a long time, just knock me out. Uh, how did she get that wonderful Frenchman? Oh my god! Thought of that. Yeah. That I'm so glad someone mentioned that. I did not think that her manicure match but she didn't she have that french manicure before christmas day she, she did i because i recall her writing in her ledger yeah. but I, you I, really I, notice them christmas but morning. you know but yeah it's like where did she get that french manicure but even if she had so that but i think she had it before then and i don't think that that manicure matched the character that she would well wouldn't a person with that kind of manicure have a different hairdo as well she I, I think she'd be more stylish than what she was, but she also seemed very cheap. She's frugal, yeah. So I can't imagine her because her clothes look dusty. Like she was clean, but like I, I don't, I don't need a new outfit. I can wear the same thing every day. Yeah, she looked like an old school mom. Yeah. 
Oh, someone said they think they may commit to watching Candy Cane Lane. We just watched, like literally before I hit live, we watched the trailer for that. Uh, I had asked you if you wanted to review it. I I would watch it, but I don't know that I want to take notes and talk about I it. I like Eddie. I mean, we can. Well, maybe that'll be the reason I watch it, because I can make a video about it. I have a feeling it's going to be in the middle, so it won't be that fun to talk about. Yeah, Eddie and Tracy Ellis Ross would be fun, though. She was more shook over them taking her money than no one being at her funeral. She really was. <laughs> yeah, she was. Her, she, she showed her true colors until the end. <laughs> oh, Sounder. That's a good one. Sa well, that's her Oscar nomination. Oh, you know, Paul Winfield. I don't want a boomerang too without uh, John Witherspoon. Oh, <laughs> like I love John Witherspoon so much. They could still do a boomerang too. Well, no Eartha either. Sure. Sure. There is a good Western version with Jack Palance and Rick Schroeder. Oh, with Rick, was Rick Schroeder, Tiny Tim. Oh, I would watch that. You know, I, well, then that makes me think of Richie Rich, which made me want to watch the Macaulay Culkin one. Yeah, I've seen a Diva's Christmas Carol. I have not. Oh, wow. Sounder was the first movie I saw with Cicely Tyson. My fourth grade teacher showed us in our social studies class. That's cool. <clears throat> and that, you know, that's in the 70s. Cicely was in stuff in the late 50s. I think she's got uh, an uncredited role in Odds Against Tomorrow, which is a great film noir uh, opposite Harry Belafonte and Robert Ryan. But she's got a really good filmography. <laughs> Not the pattern of hair on a silk wrap. I was so distracted by her wig. <laughs> My grandma had Christmas dolls that had hair just like that. It was doll head. It's doll head hair. Yeah. yeah. The hair on the ghost of the future was giving Johnny Depp as Willy Wonka. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder if the magic of Boomerang could be captured in a sequel. I think with the right director uh -huh, and cast. You know, to be, I, I think the best part of, I, Boomerang's not my favorite movie, but I think the best part of Boomerang is not Eddie Murphy. Oh no, it's Witherspoon. It's Grace Jones. It's Grace Jones, Earth, Earth the Kid. Kid, John Witherspoon. Mm -hmm. I always forget the lady who played his wife who was on Martin. But uh, mm -hmm. I think they, and Tommy Davidson's always funny. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think Eddie Murphy, well, and I like Robin Givens a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. I like everyone in that movie so much more than I like Eddie Murphy. <laughs> and Halle Berry. <laughs> or Hall I thought Halle Berry was okay. She's beautiful. Oh, but. yeah. Oh, we we wow. just watched uh, Medea's family reunion. That, um, and now I'm complete with all the Medea films. Yeah. But Cicely, her little monologue. That... I, you know, he Tyler Perry definitely helped her out at the end. And I think her last technical film was The Fall from Grace. Oh, that's right. She does say at a point that she's, uh, I, I don't have control of the minimum wage. And I didn't tell Cratch to have all these damn kids. <laughs> There's truth in that. Why did Why did he have so many? Uh, well, how many did he have? There was a lot of kids. I almost thought two. I, I, there were more than that. There were more than two kids. Oh, I think in my mind, I attributed more of the ones in the alley to him. I think <laughs> he was with all those kids in the alley. Okay, sure. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I didn't get a sense that all of those kids were in the law. But still, and we also forgot to mention that I think he was a down and out drunk who was desperate to That's alone. Right. That's how he met her, is he needed help. And yeah. But she gave him a, a loan with an ex incredibly high interest rate. Well, it was a high-risk loan. That's common practice. So I love the way Joseph pronounces names incorrectly. You mean? Oh, Susan Lucci did a version where she owned a department store. I would watch that. Yeah. Last Christmas, we watched another blast from the past from my childhood that I remember. I think it's called A Mom for Christmas. With <laughs> Olivia Newton-John. That was fun. As a mannequin that comes to life because it's this little girl's wish. And that's on YouTube. That is definitely worth it. Checking out if you like Olivia. Was the lost puppy her rosebud? <laughs> oh, yeah. I love the way he, he the, the way I pronounce interesting reminds you of Bugs Bunny as a hairdresser. <laughs> How do I say interesting? When you use it for effect, you do you do your uh, your diction. There's a Barbie version of a Christmas carol. I don't know that one. 
I, there are, I mean, there are countless. Ver- there, even that Will Ferrell movie, was that from two years ago with Ron Reynolds' Spirited? Oh, that's, that's right. That's technically I it. did like that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tiny Tim was faking it. <laughs> <laughs> he had consumption. Is that right? Is any movie with a holiday scene considered a holiday movie? Like uh, Boomerang or Spider Man, you like or things. Gremlins or Die Hard. I mean, you can. I think I would say a movie that like feels like it's during Christmas is a Chris, oh, Christmas. Movie. Even Eileen, which came out this week, is technically a Christmas movie. Eileen. Oh, that's right. It takes place on Christmas Eve. Yeah, yeah. I think any like yeah. If it's obvious that it's Christmas time, then I would say it's a Christmas movie. Hi, Shirley. <laughs> yeah, we should rewatch the Muppet version this year. She's like Yzma when she said, you should have thought about all of this before you became peasants. <laughs> exactly. Put them in a box, oh, in another box. Earth, uh... um, why did Cratchit keep having kids? That one was like older, yet poor Mrs. Cratchit kept dropping more. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Life happens. I'm not as critical of people having, well, I am critical of people having kids, but the desire to have children is very natural. Mm -hmm. I just know from my own personality, I would think that if I'm already struggling with one, I had a coworker who, when I met her, she was, wasn't pregnant yet Mm -hmm. and would complain about money and relationship and housing all the time. Then she gets pregnant, has the baby and does nothing but complain about how much more difficult it is. And then a year later, what does she tell me? I'm pregnant again. (laughs) And then after that, it's, it's it's like now it's even worse and it's more difficult. And do you know how much child care costs? And it's like, yeah, and I don't have kids. So I would have known before <laughs> that it's going to be expensive. And you and I know how much money you make. It's not enough to. Uh, <laughs> it's not enough. But whatever. Uh, I think Scrooge should have called his lawyer after Marley left. <laughs> Uh, Die Hard is considered a Christmas movie. I think that's fair. Oh, if a movie has a Christmas song, it qualifies as a Christmas movie. Sure. Why would you be eating in heaven or hell anyway? That's for the living. Well, right? I mean, yeah. I, that story was so weak. Like, I'm so not, uninspiring. I'm not supposed to be hungry anymore. Can I pick the figure I want to have? Because you know what I was thinking the entire time he was telling that story? How could I figure out how to eat with the fork? Because uh-huh. I'm like, well, I could like put the food on the fork and then make a lever out of it, like set it on something. And you know what I mean? Like, it's such a stupid anecdote. It's like when uh, the bride and Kill Bill has to learn to eat rice with chopsticks. You can get some grains in there. Because obviously the moral of the story is like learning how to share. Uh-huh. I just think that they're, that, that, that was not strong. <laughs> yeah, so if Tim had a tumor since he was born, that does seem pretty intense. But then the payoff, well, the payoff's lacking because the kid looks. He looks fine. He looks fine. <laughs> People care on Christmas, but don't give two shits the rest of the year. I know that's right. I mean, do people even care during Christmas? Violent Night or Violet Night? Violent. Violent. Have I seen that? Yeah, with David Harbour. Oh, that's right. And Beverly D'Angelo. Yeah, that was okay. I've never had a goose. Tip th- tiptoe through the tulips. That well, that's that insidious song. That's a different Tiny Tim. But I know that <laughs> song from when I was a kid, and I remember thinking Tiny Tiny Tim was like a monster to me when I was a kid. <laughs> He's creepy. <laughs> oh, so someone's a ham person for Christmas. Well, I'm a uh, tamales for Christmas person. What did your mom make for Christmas? Oh, I don't even remember now. Probably ham. Uh, mm. As an adult, I would be, um, like now, I feel like if we had to have a tradition, it would be Chinese or Indian for Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if we had a family, I would say we're going to go eat Chinese. Or Ethiopian. Are they open on Christmas? Time? I don't know. But but yeah, it would be, um, it would probably be Chinese or Indian. Like in a Christmas story. <laughs> Can we talk about when she fed that lady soup with the wooden spoon? Yeah, that was 
I was on the couch like, <laughs> no. What about and any children that grew up? Phil, Phil, even the homeless deserve sanitary uh, conditions. This is <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Be like, but couldn't she? Could you? Could you give me a bowl? I would rather she dipped her hands in the bowl and did this versus no, put that spoon. That. <laughs> I don't want that either. No, put it in my hand. If I were, a, if, if I was that little boy, there's no chance I'm waiting in the cold snow for some old lady to fold me a paper airplane. Right. Well, that part, but also he, it's not just any old lady. It's Miss Scrooge, who he knows is a mean old lady. I would have been like, all right, then, but like, keep it moving. Because he didn't know she was going to give him money. No. That she, scene was not well done. She just, and she seemed crazy. She's wailing <laughs> like a dental drill out of her window. It's like, leave me alone. Cratchit's wife did seem ungrateful, though. Wow. Well, also, does she work? Well, that, you know, I always think, well, because I'm a, mo you know, I'm a modern independent lady. So to me, it's like. Well, like, what are you doing? I don't know. Well, she's a homemaker, which is a full-time job. There's not much to make in that home. She could do something. Yeah, when you don't have shit, what, what is there to manage? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, leave the kids at home and go to work. I mean, they could, they're already suffering. I don't know. Um, Learn a trade you can do in your home. I, don't know. I made a beautiful Wellington for my now ex-husband. He was so mad that it was pink in the middle and screamed at me while he pan fried his slice. Uh, our first Christmas. Beef Wellington. Um, what did I say? Wellington. Oh. <laughs> I, You know, it took me growing up. Well, we didn't have money. Like, as a kid, we didn't have money. So eating, like a, like, a nice piece of meat was not ever really an option. So we usually ate, like, the shitty cuts, which required that they be overcooked, right? Like, uh, in a crock pot or a lot of like flank steak that was marinated charred in some sauce forever so that was my idea of beef so then when i finally had access to nicer things which at first was people taking me to dinner so when i first you know like in college and like go on dates and these older men would take me to these fancy restaurants and I remember the first couple of times learning, like, you do not order your filet mignon well done. <laughs> no, no. They looked at me like, they's trash, Miss Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> they's trash, Miss Charlotte. They's trash. Yeah, just don't get it then. Just don't get it. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I now I enjoy my meat. Uh, my, yeah. It, it can be a little pink nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're, yeah, I grew up that way too. I think there's always the fear of uh, getting worms in my <laughs> My dad was a hunter though. So he would, you know, shoot live game and, and dress it. and make. So there was always uh, a, a fear of contagion in my house as well. Everything was in the fridge all the time. Peanut butter. <laughs> like people that keep their eggs or butter out, like that blows you, my mind. You do like to throw everything in the refrigerator. I do. That's Because I thought when we first met, you would put bread in the refrigerator. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> that's don't right. nobody want this cold ass bread? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I've gotten out of the habit of that, but <laughs> I forgot about that till just now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, why is he putting bread in the? That's how I grew up, and also never throwing anything away. And Nick won't throw anything away. Food. I have to, well, other you you just you don't want to throw anything away. I have to sneak things to like throw them away, like food. You'll well, you'll have to let me know. Ooh, if I catch <laughs> you throwing out my things, then what you gonna do? Oh, you'll see. <laughs> yes rotten food sure but but you're you're the opposite then like oh you made that two days ago it's like yeah it's still good i will throw things away with the quickness mm -mm. with the quickness i'll throw gifts away if like <laughs> especially at work when people get because i get a lot of stuff like well yeah that kind of stuff but yeah if i don't need it or want it i'm not yeah, it's getting thrown away. There's no point. I think I think it feels good to let go of. Because also it's like this thing's been here for so, like an unreasonable amount of time, right? Like just anything, not even food, but it's like, oh, this, these pair of pants I haven't worn in six years because I've gained too much weight. And it's a constant reminder that makes me feel bad about myself. Well, yeah. What's the point? Or like some... 
anything that's like, well, what, like, what does this tchotchke even mean? Like, what value does it have? You know, that's how I, there, I, I, I mean, I always say everything I own could fit in like a small bin, like that, that I would want to keep. Cause a lot of things are replaceable. A lot of things remind me of things that I don't even want to be reminded of, like, but I just keep them anyway, like, or that are around that I don't need. Whatever. I, I've made my point. Yeah. Note taken. Oh, okay. We should review a Christmas horror story with William Shatner. Have you heard of that? <laughs> no. Oh my God. <laughs> I still love that movie in Esperanto. <laughs> oh, there are more comments than I thought there were. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oops. Wait. I've never seen the George C. Scott version either. I've actually never seen Patton. You know Alfie Woodard does that thing when she's playing a crackhead. I love Alfred Woodard. I do too. And she should have received an Oscar nomination for um, Clemency. Clemency, mm -hmm. but she's an Oscar nominee, though. I know, but she should have received another one. Yeah. Uh, is it warm in LA? It was dumping rain here in Washington. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, during the winter in LA, it's like sunny during the day, but then at night it gets like what, 45, 50 degrees. So it's a little chilly. Like you would definitely want sleeves. Yeah. But I don't think you need a coat. Because, you know, where do you walk? B -b -b besides the building to the car. like, <laughs> So you can get away with not having a jacket on. What kind of version of this movie would you write? Oh, something R-rated for sure. I'd have to think. Well, you didn't ask me the question. But. Something about an older homosexual. Um, so, yeah, Cic Bustin Loose has come up before in our lives, but yeah, with Richard Pryor and Cicely Tyson, who are at the opposite ends of uh, behavioral issues. <laughs> but they had no chemistry in that. This movie came out before I was born? Cic Wait, so, this per so Red Honey was born in the late 90s, early 2000s? <laughs> well, it is 2023. <laughs> And Cicely doesn't look any different in the movie than she does now. <laughs> well, well, she's, dead she's now. in the ground right now. But yeah, she... She, she looked the same for She looked years, the same for, for a decades. very long time. Cicely Tyson played in Bustin' Loose with Richard Pryor. I just said that, yeah. Oh. Uh, we have not seen Susan Lucci's version. No. Oh, yeah. I've seen Soap, right? I have not. not so are you talking about Soap Dish? No, Soap. Oh, I haven't seen Soap. Uh, are we going to do a Boys from Brazil review? Just Brazil. Wait, it's just, wait, what am I? Catherine, Hel I mean, assuming that's Catherine Hellman. So yes, yes. Brazil. Yeah, wait, Boys, Boys from Brazil is the Ira Levin novel. With about the Nazis. George. Yes, yeah. Uh, that's what I was thinking in my head. Joseph Mengele. Is Gregory Pleck playing Joseph Mengele. I was thinking the Nazi movie. That's a great movie. And, um. Uta Hagen and Steve Gutenberg and uh, who's what? What's his name? Who I'm forgetting. That was married to Joan Plowright, Lawrence. Do Olivier. you think I would? Do you really think I would know that? <laughs> you should know who Lawrence Olivier is. Is he from the Ten Commandments? The Charlton Heston. Oh, isn't Lawrence Olivier in like a big epic, like religious movie? Well, he won his Oscar for Hamlet. No. Mm. Please say hi to my nephew, Nico, who's visiting. Hi, Nico. I got to see the RuPaul version. I think it's only available on VH1. Yeah. <laughs> like if you have a, like through, through, through your cable provider. It's not a WoW Presents or something? No. Oh. Well, actually, maybe after all this time it is, but it wasn't for the first two years, I think. It's not Christmas for me without Charlie Brown and the music of Vincent Guaraldi. He, oh yeah, I yeah. actually was playing that song. Charlie, a couple days I ago. mean, uh, that artist whose name I'm blanking on was from Minnesota because there there were all those Charlie Brown statues everywhere. That's right. Well, yeah. What's his name? Uh, Somebody will probably write it in. Yeah. What's the name of the I'll artist who did myself? Yeah, because like the guy, the guy who painted Snoopy. Because I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Can we review the women of Brewster Place? I just said that right before that we need to watch this. Because I've never seen Women of Brewster. Because Sicily's in that and, of course, Oprah. Oh, wait. So I'm... I am lost. Okay. Like Scrooge. I'm lost like Scrooge. Uh, have I worked with scalp pigmentation? Uh, no. My thoughts? I... I think it could be good. Like, I have a scar in the back of my head that I think that would work very well for. But I think when you do your hairline, the problem with that is, like, like if you did it, then you'd all, like, you'd have to keep your hair, like, buzzed so close all the time because then it looks extra crazy when your natural hair grows longer than the pigmentation appears. I just, I don't know. I I think for little scars that people have that aren't on their hairline, <clears throat> like the one I have, I, I would consider it. But even then, I'm a little apprehensive because sometimes I do shave the back like 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 a skin fade. So then all of a sudden, I'd have this little weird spot that has like, it looks like I have some sort of birthmark. I don't know. I love tattoos, but when I think like the illusion of the skin pigmentation, I don't know. Plus, you see guys who do it, and we had dinner with someone not too long ago who does that. Yeah, we did. I don't remember the context of that dinner. He's the guy who won. Uh, oh yeah, now I know. Big Brother, mm -hmm. but anyway, he now does uh, like skin pigmentation, like filling in like beards, and I don't like that. I didn't like the examples he showed me. I didn't like that. It's very DJ Khaled. It's very like that porn actor, the French guy who's in that one movie we watched. The Honore film? There's that porn actor Frank, in it. Frank. Yes. Frank, Frank, Francois something. Mm -hmm. that, that's the image I get of people who get that done. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Oh, yeah. There's that new Christmas movie with Jennifer Garner called Family Switch, which is, she's in 13 going on 30. Yeah, that looks terrible, but... The fact she's 51 and had a nine month old baby. Uh, Nicole Kidman is coming out with a film this year called Holland, Michigan. And she has a straight up nine year old that we're supposed to. <laughs> I thought Zac Efron in Iron Claw was really good. He's excellent. He yeah. made me teary eyed a couple times. I think we both like Bad Santa. I like Bad Santa. Actually, I could rewatch Bad Santa. Cloris Leachman is a really fun supporting role in that. Cloris Leachman is also really fun in uh, the wedding planner, the the wedding ringer, the wedding ringer, yeah, wedding <laughs> where she planner. gets lit on fire at the dinner table. <laughs> Do you have any plans to read Otessa Moshfeg? Yeah, I have a couple books by her. Um, yeah, I'll get to it. I really liked Eileen. So, if you poison them, please make sure you kill me. I don't want to be sick. Yeah, I don't I want don't. him to be sick either. He's miserable when he doesn't feel well, and it doesn't take much. <laughs> Oh, someone finally caught a live. Welcome. Uh, Nick, on your birthday, it was uploaded on Ion Cinema, your great interview conversation with Jao Kaniho. I don't know how you were able to do that because Kaniho is such a reclusive director. How did you score that? Well, you were paid to interview him. I was him, paid right? to interview him. Uh, so someone sought Nick out to do it. That's the second time I've interviewed that man. Oh, it is? I interviewed him in 2011 at the AFI Film Festival for Blood of My Blood. But it's because he Bad Living is Portugal's official submission for Best International Feature. So anybody that's... All of these people from all over the world, from their respective countries that are have an official submission film, are in L.A. about now or doing these kinds of interviews. And all of those interviews you do, you get paid. So yes. So that's why, because I people sometimes ask, why don't we interview other people? I don't. I certainly don't want to interview people. But um, all the ones you've done, you 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 were paid. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he was interesting to talk to. It, it, I mean, I, I love his body of work. There's a lot of his stuff that's very hard to get a hold of because he's been around since the late 80s. Uh, and so his first few features I have not seen, but his latest is really good. I shouldn't say I wouldn't want to interview people. I would interview people who I enjoyed something they did. I don't want to just... Because we get a lot of emails 
saying like, do you want to interview the blah, blah, blah of this upcoming thing? And it's like, well, no, no. Cause what if I don't like the movie? <laughs> yeah. That was a lesson I learned really quickly when I first started going to Sundance is um, because the way that Sundance is set up for the press screenings, they're pretty limited. They're, like there's one screening and and if you're like me and trying to see everything, you have to see some public things and to get tickets to the public things, you'd have to agree to interview these people. And there were several, many people I interviewed. I'm like, I hated this. Well, <laughs> to quote Patty LaBelle and got to be real. I like to keep it real, but when I'm fake, I'm real fake. So I probably could get through it, but I don't, I, I, it wouldn't feel good. And I don't need to do that. Like, I don't need to. Yeah. It doesn't feel it's. Mm -mm. I, I get along with, like, I can talk to most people. I, like, I just wouldn't mention the things that I thought were stupid or I would of find course. something to talk about. But, like, that doesn't, like, for what? Unless I'm getting paid, then maybe. But. Or or if you're talking to somebody you, whose work you really admire, but the last, the thing that they're marketing currently is not very good is also difficult. We seem energetic this morning. Uh do all bad movies do this to us? <laughs> I mean, it's sometimes it's more fun to talk about a bad movie. Am I in a good mood today? I don't know. <laughs> That'd be rare. Um, I just got lost. You. Oh my God, a, vasect a vasectomy is so easy. I did one in med school. The dude ate chips and texted on his phone, drove himself home. <laughs> and they are reversible sometimes, I understand. Mm -hmm. What is this about Tiny Tim dying on stage? Oh. Thank you, Jonah. Mr. Joseph, if you, if you don't mind me asking, what is that, what is that a picture of right now? above your stove in the middle of their kitchen. Um, well, I'm not going to get up because I'm not wearing proper pants, but uh, it's a picture of Janet Jackson and Sigourney Weaver together. Circa at a, 2007 or 8. At a, um, like a, like a uh, charity event. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase. With the shadow on above the stove looking like Fritz Lang's M. Oh, that's right. <laughs> or M for, uh, oh no, I'm thinking V for Vendetta. <laughs> M for Madam X, I guess. Oh, someone finished uh, decorating their house for Christmas. Did we ever review Jane Campion's Power of the Dog? No. We did a podcast. Did we? I am I feel like we have a podcast where we talk about Power of the Dog. We did, but I don't think it's one that was dedicated I, to I don't think the... Oh, yeah. The name is not... The name of the podcast is not Power of the Dog, but we do talk at length about Power of the Dog. And I did review it out of the Venice Film Festival. Also, oh, Nick has a written review of it. Mm -hmm. That was my first Venice that year. Well, there are other modern independent ladies here. Right on. <laughs> when you don't have shit, what is there to manage? <laughs> I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be insensitive, but it's true though. I mean, if you're down and out, I I feel like some things need to take a back seat to like sense and sensibility. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I can't leave my kids alone, but I also can't feed them. They take your ass to work. I don't know. My mom is the same way with food. Yeah, my family, I don't we did not. I mean, your family had way more money than my family did, but well, no, during the first my dad was laid off when I was born for the first 7 years, so it was just my mom supporting us. Yeah, but I think we struggled a lot more than your family did. And like for, sure well i mean you guys weren't on welfare with food stamps and well wick but sure so but yeah for some reason my family is not like that at all even my dad who's yeah he he was never like throw that shit away oh yeah no it was <laughs> we, we eat all the leftovers mm -hmm. my mom was also i think really good at well my, i guess i have a question then because my mom seemed to be very good at making like the appropriate amount of food for the for like for dinner. So was your mom making like big helpings of things, and that's why you had so much of it? 
No, just that when there was extra food, you would not throw it away. But what I'm saying is like Maria would like, she would cook every night and she would go get like, cause she'd walk to the grocery store and get a few little things. And then she would make dinner for the night and then it would be done. Like, so, so I guess I wonder like for families, is that what's more common? What would happen in your case? Well, would there be leftovers? There or? weren't leftovers every night, but like I said, when there were, you don't throw them away. Or, you know, like we would make homemade bread or anything that was made to last a little bit. But cereal, my dad would buy like cheap bulk cereal. and that's I'm only saying it because I, I'm, I'm saying that we never did that, but also because I don't recall ever having like a situation where there were leftovers all the time. And, oh, my, my mom made us eat spaghetti for a week or like that never happened that we would eat the same thing every day. Yeah, every now and then she'd make like, well, a pot of, that's why I don't like pea soup now. Cause it's like, maybe every winter she'd make a, a vat of it. And it's like, oh, that's, oh, that's no. like five days in a row. In fact, I would have to beg her to make a bulk of my favorite things so I could have it like the next day. So there were like some key dishes that I would say like, can you make a bigger, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it's after one hour. Ooh, you lost 15 pounds in four days from bad cheesecake. Oh, who was just really sick? With digestive issues? Didn't someone have food poisoning? And we were with, oh. Oh, our friend, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's not fun. Oh, yeah, Christmas, oh, Sigourney would be Charles a Schultz. Charles Schultz, see, yeah. Then, and then Thank you. Uh, yeah, Sigourney would be great in uh, as Scrooge. Do I belong to Marie Kondo's school of decluttering? <laughs> well, I'm not that strict because I don't live alone, but if I, I did, it would be barren. I've never seen Ruby in Paradise with Ashley Judd. I remember the VHS cover and I remember my dad, because we were at the v VHS video rental store, you know, once a week. And this old lady who chain smoked at this place called JC Video was like, oh, have you seen Ruby in Paradise? And my dad's like, I'm not renting that. <laughs> <laughs> we kept everything in the fridge too plus nick is a low-key hoarder we definitely could live together well if you want to dm me i can maybe make that possible <laughs> can we wife swap can i get someone uh who wants to live in uh a, a minimalist lifestyle mm -hmm. Yeah, I did say all my things could fit in a lunch pail. I actually have a Beetlejuice lunch pail with all my little things that I would want to keep. And that lunch pail has like four things in it. There isn't even... How about that? Although recently my mom gave me a bunch of old school stuff that, I mean, I would probably throw away the next time I find them. But... <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But here we are. Mm -hmm. My dad used to make my dad used to make us save body soap slivers to combine into a bigger soap back in the eighties. Yeah, that sounds similar to things my dad would do. Well, to be fair, I think if you're like a family that uses a lot of stuff, like me, like because I use bar soap sometimes, it takes so long to use the bar soap that by the time that it gets little, it's like wow, that's it's a dollar ninety nine, like. Just throw it away. I mean, that's why it's hard for me to watch a film like This Boy's Life because the De Niro character, which that's based on a true story, my dad would have behaviors like that that are like, uh, I want to forget some of those things happen. But... Of course. Uh, someone leaves butter out on the counter. Well, so I, you know, I, I complain so hard whenever we go out to eat and they give us cold butter with our bread. Well, yeah. So, but the only problem is we don't eat butter enough to leave it out. No. But. But if you plan, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So if you know you're going to be using butter for this this recipe or for dinner, if you keep banging your pots, out. you won't have any pots to bang on. A good line from Michael Caine, yes, in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. But uh. <laughs> it's cold at night, but I sweat during the day. <laughs> what are your winter reading plans? Oh God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. I, Berlin's probably going to announce their lineup. So if there's some things that are based on books there, I'll probably try to read. Like Limanov has been on my list for a while, um, but I keep putting it off. But I was born, Red Honey was born in 1999. It's a good so year. you can't even rent a car at Hertz <laughs> or Avis or National or Enterprise. <laughs> um, but I'm not, uh, I, I, 
youth is for the young or what's the saying? I don't know because I never felt young. Whatever the case may be, I cherish the wonder of life and the newness of living. So what is that from? Absolutely fabulous. Oh, yes. <laughs> when Patsy's giving that interview, trying to be all, and she says she lives a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> you, you <used laughs> when she to, hasn't eaten solid food since 1972. <laughs> you used to trot that out all the time. <laughs> My favorite TV show. Um, yeah, I haven't seen Patton or Rocky yet. That'll have to be remedied soon. What did I think of Beyonce's hair at the Renaissance premiere? To be honest, someone, like, immediately I got DMs of that image. And I thought it was a wax figure. I, 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 not even being funny, I thought, oh, it's a Beyonce wax figure. You know, lighting makes a big difference. As someone with darker skin, like, depending on the light, I can look like, there could be like a forge, a four shade difference. So I think this whole, like, she's lightening her skin is ridiculous. I think the lighting combined with the hair color made her look. And then she's wearing this reflective light silver outfit. Yeah, she does look very fair, but that's just lighting. I mean, look at Cicely Tyson in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, bad lighting made her look so different. But, but I won't speak ill of Beyonce on camera. Well, what, what, Again. Is, what is there ill to say? Really? <laughs> and there is anything ill to say. Gregory Peck was dreamy. Who's Gregory Peck? Oh, you don't know Gregory Peck? To Kill a Mockingbird? Addict Finch? Gentleman's Agreement? You've seen him. He has a very distinct way of speaking. But of course, he was in Boys from Brazil, which I know you've seen as well. You know Gregory Peck. Let's see here. From what year? Well, the 40s. Because by the time he's Atticus, he's even more. Like this? Yeah. Well, he's very young there, but... Y'all lusting after this child? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't recognize no, him? Um, I recognize this person, kind yeah. of. I, from 12 Angry Men. Is that him? Was he in 12 Angry Men? I don't remember him in 12 Angry Men. I haven't watched that in years, though. I think I recognize him from 12 Angry Men. But now we got to look it up. Mm. I'm on IMDb, let's see. Anyway, moving on. What year is 12 Angry Men? Like 57. Okay. Well, let's see. Sidney Lumet's debut. Well, I don't think I'm correct, but then who's in 12 Angry Men then? A lot of other people. 12, 12, 12. Wasn't that a big movie? <laughs> yes. You movie. don't know who's in it? Since you know so much, okay, it's well, Henry Fonda. Yeah, I know Gregory Peck's not in it. Do we get a live tree for Christmas? No. We don't even have a fake tree for Christmas. We used to for years. Well, we used to, mm -hmm. and then I got rid of it, as I want to do. Yep. He's like, oh, a well, light's not working. you got to throw this away. Joseph loves to throw things away. Anything you throw away. Doesn't want to recycle, per se. I won't throw you away just yet. Um, me trying to recycle aluminum cans. Let me tell you what Nick is doing. Oh, my. Oh, my. One day, Nick says, I want to start recycling cans. And I'm like, okay, because we drink a lot of stuff in cans. And we have the bins, like in our garage, we have the 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 black bin and the blue bin for recycling. So I'm thinking this man is going to start actually putting cans in the blue bin. No, we were doing that. But then he says, no, I want to collect them to take them to the recycling center. Yeah. Like a damn hobo. And I don't think you understand that the bat so so I said what I don't want to have happen is my garage is filled with cans. And it's not. Three months later, it's just a big bag of cans out there. It's not full. They're crushed. Well, wait, he, he does crush them. The problem is, I don't think you understand that all this effort and time that it's going to take to go and do it, you're going to get like seven dollars out of that bag. It's not worth the time. You should put that bag in the blue bin <clears throat> and then let the people who salvage the bins take them so they can get the money. You don't need $7 and you don't need to clutter up my garage with cans. This is a topic for off camera. Well, the question is why are you, are, like, are you recycling for sustainability or because you want $7? That's the question. <laughs> Lawrence yeah. of Arabia. What about it? Who's in that movie? Peter O'Toole and uh, Omar Sharif. Christmas Carol in Space. 
Well, the cat didn't bother the Christmas tree, really. And now we have a nice spot for a Christmas tree because we could put it downstairs in front of that window. Mm -hmm. And that yellow chair could move. But I, you know, like, you know, if things go well, I think next year, like after Christmas, I will get a tree, like, you know how they go on clearance, like Markdown? I'll get a nice tree to save for the following Christmas. Mm -hmm. Have you seen The Ref? Didn't you talk about that recently? I love The Ref. Uh, Dennis Leary and Christine Baranski, I think, is a great role in that. And um, the guy from The Godfather, that's his little sidekick, Judy Davis. Kevin Spacey, I think, too. We always cheer someone up. That's nice to hear. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad someone mentioned the scalp color spray. I love that spray. The company I work for makes a spray that I like, but I also um, like the hair fiber, like the, the topics. It's great for filling in, like, like my hair gets spot, spotty as it's growing. Because when I curl, like how now it's twisted, there you can see scalp until it gets long enough that it covers it. So then I'll use the spray so that you can't see like my scalp or then like I'm thinning a little bit in the back. So as my hair is growing, it's more obvious until it fills in. So I think I, I really like those and they don't get on. I haven't had embarrassing moments where like my, I mean, I don't really, I'm not doing anything to sweat, but like <laughs> I do go to the gym and I don't, I don't really sweat, but like, yeah, it stays where it's supposed to stay. You don't care. Nick is an excellent film critic and writer. Thank you. No, I'm bald. I don't care about other people's hair problems. I've learned to love myself without hair, without the vestigial patch of fur that it is. This movie is on YouTube. I am making uh, my worst hair of 2023 video. Mm -hmm. Is that just going to be its own video? Yeah. Okay. Well, because we'll do the best, the worst, the worst hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Imagine me interviewing hair and makeup people. I would never do that because I wouldn't criticize. Some, you know, the other thing I understand too is like sometimes I've been asked to do jobs where it's like, I don't know what I'm doing or like you didn't tell me this is what we were doing or you didn't have the proper, like it's, I don't blame oftentimes the hair and makeup people because if you show up on set and all they have is some old raggedy synthetic wig, what are we going to do? We're shooting in three hours. I can't order a lace front human hair wig or we don't have, they don't have the budget for that. Mm -hmm. So I would never talk to another hairstylist or makeup artist. Like, what were you thinking? If anything, I would ask the filmmaker, like, wh why don't we, I've said this before, like, why don't you budget? That was part of the SAG AFTRA uh, negotiations was making sure that they have proper hair and makeup for i forget the language they use but like ethnic hair textured mm -hmm. hair and darker skin tones because yeah it's like if you hire a makeup artist and they don't know who they're working with and they show up on set and they don't have the correct palettes the correct tools to work with certain types of hair it's like i mean yes yeah, they're partially to blame for not being like not anticipating all things but also the filmmakers and these producers are responsible for making sure people look right. Well, right. And there's some communication that can be uh, to fix some of those things as well. Because I feel like a lot of opportunities aren't. I think sometimes, you know, it, it like it is racially motivated, but I, but, but I don't think people are trying to be like actively racist. I think sometimes people think like, well, if I hire you and me, I'm going to have, you know, like the one person who's going to do your makeup, like if I have to get someone to do his and then his hair versus if I hire two people who look like you, then I can kill two birds. I, I feel like that happens a lot, that, that that they were like, oh, let's hire, like, let's hire this black woman, but then we're not going to do her right with her hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. So... Tiny Tip did die on stage. The video's on YouTube. What is this? What, what are people talking about? So there's a stage play of A Christmas Carol where Tiny Tip dies on stage? The actor like, playing. Like dies. the actor really ah. dies? June 2021. I have a written review for that. Joseph never watched it all. 
I read. I I put on Dune twice in our old house, and I could not get through it. My favorite Charlotte Rampling in it, but uh, I'm about. I'll read Children of Dune, the sequel. Although the the Villeneuve version is only really half the first Frank Herbert book. Jonah, thank you again, Mister Nick. I recently saw you guys our very first YouTube video reviewing movies, and I have to say, you've not aged one bit. You have truly given people a run for their money because you look truly ageless. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Someone doesn't tell me that behind the scenes, but <laughs> I think what, what did you just say? That's a conversation for off camera. Off camera. Mm -hmm. I found baloney in the fridge that went bad in May. Sometimes we'll be digging in the drawer, and it's not even you not I mean, you're not deliberately keeping expired things, but sometimes you'll look and be like, oh, oh yeah. Or it'll be like, oh, we had this in like our house before the last house. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like dry goods. <laughs> like 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 some ingredient you would never use, like quinoa or something, is like eight years old. <laughs> you know, I, I've learned over the years to look at expiration dates on spices because <laughs> there there have been. You know, we've been in Los Angeles for a while and moved several times. And there are things that have followed us. There were spices that followed us from Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> like some Mrs. Dash shit. <laughs> yes. That Mrs. Dash was probably like 10 years <laughs> old. It aired in 2010. <laughs> and we threw that away two years ago. Yeah. Red Honey can rent a car. It's just not at a higher price. Well, that's good. Someone called Beyonce Jackson. <laughs> How many ab fab? How many waking up in a dumpster with a smashed cig and a smeared lipstick? I love that show so much. Yeah. Without being maudlin, I totally feel Nick's I never felt young makes aging easier. Yeah, I never felt like uh I related to anyone my age growing up. So well, I always say I was never a hot young thing, so I don't feel like I lost anything. So getting older, I feel like I don't look like I don't long or I, I don't mourn the loss of like glory days. Yeah. Cause I was not, cause you see some people and it's like, Oh, oh you yeah. fell off. Yeah. High school was <laughs> your, too. high school was your moment. It's like, no, I was, uh, I'd rather have the opposite be the ugly duckling. I do fall down rabbit holes. Oh yeah. Roman holiday with Audrey Hepburn's Oscar win. Okay. With Gregory Ooh. Peck. I need $7. <laughs> I'll give you $7 to throw those cans away. <laughs> It's the principle. It's not the money. It's the principle. What if someone said they'll come take the cans? Take them. Take them. If someone wants a bag of uh, aluminum cans, you could have them. And then you'll feel good knowing that you helped Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. Have you watched The Gilded? No. Somebody had a Herzog question I missed. But... You look great without hair. Nick, you're a beautiful, bald white man. Thank you. I thought you were wrapping up the stream. Oh, is that what you said? Oh, or is, is someone saying you want me to wrap it up? Okay. Um, you have a good head for being bald. That's true. Thank you. Yes, I love Night of the Hunter. That's a Robert Mitchum and Lillian Gish. Shelly Winters is so damn good in that. Mm. We haven't eat it, eat it. I, I haven't eat it yet. Um, I found food from the Obama administration. Oh my God. Have you seen like water for chocolate? Oh yeah. I mean, what's the, the best giallo? Realism movement. Best giallo. I don't know. Fifth or uh, fifth court. I have seen with uh, Franco Nero, right? Oh. I Suspiria is just the early Argento films are fantastic, but. Well, I'll, um, I'm sure we'll do a live next week. I'm not sure what the theme will be. Um, and what have you done to Solange? That's a good giallo. I don't know. I thought you said Christmas animals. Oh, yes. Maybe Christmas films related to like animals, like how the dog saved Christmas. I was inspired by the most recent How Did This Get Made? I would um, like to watch Prancer, but that's just me. All right. Well, do you have anything else you want to say? No. All right. Bye.